Runner's material will be synthesizing paratoluene sulfonic acid, otherwise known as paratolzoic acid. This is a useful acid catalyst in the organic lab, and we'll be using it in a future video. So the first step is to remove the methyl thiophene impurity my toluene, because I bought technical grade toluene. This impurity is present because it's present in petroleum, and toluene is the fill from petroleum, and they have very close boiling points. Anyways, to our toluene, 100 milliliters, we're going to add 20 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid and give it very strong stirring. And even with very strong stirring, the sulfuric acid really does not want to mix. So, yeah, it, the density really is different. After 30 minutes of strong stirring, the sulfuric acid went yellow, and now we're going to separate the toluene off by just decanting it. You could use a sep funnel, but you don't have to. And then my OCD kicked in, and I, of course, I had to use a pipette to separate it. Anyways, add a bit of sodium bicarbonate, stir it, and remove that as well, discard that as well. Add a bit of, of magnesium sulfate to dry the toluene off, and it looks very pretty. Now we're going to filter our toluene into a flask, and it should be methyl thiophene free. It was not, so I added 20 more milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid, heated it to 55 Celsius this time, and that should remove methyl thiophene, right? Theoretically, yeah. And you can see it's a lot more yellow now. So that's a good sign. Well, yellow chemistry is bad, but that's a good sign because we're removing the yellow. Anyways, we're going to pour off our toluene. And you can see just by bringing it up to 55 Celsius, we already have some toluene sulfonic acid forming. Even though we're not driving the reaction. Anyways, 20 milliliters sulfuric acid is added for the actual sulfonation of toluene, and it went yellow because yellow chemistry. Anyways, we're going to add this um, weird Dean Stark apparatus on top. It's a very weird one. The side neck is oddly short. I have no idea why. Anyways, on top we add a reflux condenser, and we bring this up to a boil. Again, strong stirring in the toluene sulfuric acid mixture, otherwise it won't sulfonate properly because it's not being mixed very thoroughly. You can see this very cool effect at first, and our distillate collected is cloudy because there's water in the toluene. And now after a while, we'll just let this run, and you can see the toluene actually has quite a, large, uh, quite a high boiling point, and it really does not take much to condense it. It's refluxing in the reflux condenser that's not even water-cooled. However, I ended up having to water-cool it because my condenser was a bit short. Theoretically, if you had a long enough reflux condenser or like a long enough Vigro column, you could use that as a reflux condenser and not need water-cooling, but I ended up using it because why not? So... Yeah, you can see it's slowly climbing up my um, uh, condenser, so that was quite fun to watch. It always is. And then I connected on the cooling water, and here's the toluene. You can see it's pretty clear, which is good, and you can see occasionally a bit of water falls off and separates off to the bottom, where it'll be drained off. Every like 10 or 20 minutes, drain off the water. This is your way of knowing when the reaction is done, because... There really is no way <laughs> other than measuring the amount of water you get. So the easiest method, of course, is just to remove water until no more water comes over because I'm too lazy to do the math. And you can see this water is cloudy because it has a bit of toluene in it. You could recover it, but I just discarded it. It's not really much toluene in there. You can see water slowly separating and this, re this reflex took like, I don't know, what, like one or two hours to finish? I've, I have I completely forgot, but you can see water separate here. Now across this time lapse, you can see a gradient slowly crawling up, and that's water in the toluene. But anyways, after a while, no more water's coming over, so we shall take the stuff in our flask, and we're gonna put it into a beaker under very strong ventilation, because it's still hot. We have to we have to pour it out while it's still hot, otherwise it'd solidify. You can see the toluene fumes. Now we'll add in 10 milliliters of water, and there's quite a violent reaction, both from the disassociation of the leftover sulfuric acid, and also because the mixture is high above the uh, boiling point of water. Afterwards, not much violence, and we'll just let this stir for like 5 minutes, and then let it cool down. What we're doing here is we're separating our toluic acid out of the toluene by forming toluic acid monohydrate, which is not soluble in toluene. So after cooling it down in an ice bath, you can see we have some nice little crystals, and we're just going to remove these and filter it off. And now, because this is a biphasic mixture, there's water and toluene in, um, in the mixture, it 
it's not easy to f filter this dry because the toluene saturates the filter, then the filter won't really filter the water unless you pull a vacuum on it for a very long time. Anyways, here's our filtrate. You can see there's a decent amount of toluene in there, and we'll be covering that because you can use this toluene for future runs. In the meantime, let's just scoop our towels. I'll gas it out, and you can see my OCD really kicked in, and I scooped everything out. The frit was very clean. I have no idea why I do this, and there really you aren't going to lose much if you don't scrape the frit clean, but I did it because I am just like this. Anyways, we shall take our wet towels of gas and place it in a desiccator. And now, it would actually be a good idea first to put this outside and let the toluene evaporate off, because the toluene inhibits evaporation of water. So, yeah, after letting it dry for a while in between, I let it um, evaporate in the air for a while. Anyways, we should take our filter, treat it with a bit of sodium bicarbonate, separate the toluene off, and dry it off with a little magnesium sulfate. Filter it off into a flask and distill our toluene. Now, this toluene is methyl thiophene free, so you could use it for, I don't know, like weird chemistry that can't have methyl thiophene. I mean, what really do you need methyl thiophene free toluene for? I can't really think of a reason. Anyways, uh, you can see here after like three or four days, the toluene has all evaporated off. And I learned that tosylic acid is deliquescent, which means that it's so hygroscopic, it would have literally liquefy in air, similar to calcium chloride. So I place it back in the desiccator because all the toluene's evaporate off now and it'll dry properly. And now after like three more days, it's completely dry, so I crushed it up and we're gonna place it in a bottle. Now, you do have to seal it very well, of course, because it's deliquescent, and you'll liquefy it if you don't seal it properly. So, I seal it actually well. So now let's talk about why parasulfonation is favored. First, let's take a look at the benzene ring. The benzene ring has double bonds on it. Now, through some electron transferring, you can change the double bonds to a different spot. This overall does not consume any energy, which means that tall, um, benzene or the benzene ring will readily inconvert between these two forms resonance. So if you took a measurement of the bonds in benzene, they wouldn't be double bonds and single bonds. They would be in between there because the bonds are switching around so fast that they have the properties of both. Well, at least like they're half of each. Anyways, now we know that what resonance is, let's talk about the sulfonation itself. So here we have sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is an equilibrium with sulfur trioxide and water. Although I wrote it this way because I am weird. You could just write 1H2SO4 equals SO3 plus H2O. Anyways, here's a um, thing I found off uh, internet. Doc Brown. Uh, I think it's like Doc Brown's science or whatever. Pretty neat um, little website. And now, it doesn't go into detail on why parasulfonation is favored, but it does tell you how sulfonation works. So, basically, one of the bonds donates an electron to the sulfur trioxide, then it forms an unstable cat, um, cat uh, carbocation, which then splits off and you get your sulfonated toluene and sulfuric acid again. Now, let's talk about why meta is not favored. Now, on benzene, there's ortho, para, and meta, um, spots. So let's take a look at phenol. Phenol is able to deprotonate and it's able to form these resonance structures, which if you take an average of, you'll get this thing. So you have two times para than, uh, no, you have two times ortho than para. So ortho substitution is twice more likely than para. And that is in fact seen when you try to chlorinate um, phenol, monochlorinate it at least. You'll get two times more um, orthochlorophenol than parachlorophenol. So, this checks out. So, the meta isn't favored because the electron jumps to every other carbon atom. It's never the adjacent one. Never. So, you might be saying, Edward, this is phenol, this is not toluene. Toluene and phenol are different. And you are right. Let's take a look at toluene. Now, toluene, unfortunately, does not readily deprotonate. However, the idea is still there. The methyl group, while it won't deprotonate rather like spontaneously, it does impart a charge still. So the electron is not physically moving, but it, there is like a charge on those carbons in the ortho and para position. And now it is important to remember, this is a partial charge. This is not a full charge, which means that meta substitution still occurs, but less likely. So now we know this. Why is para why is para um, 
favored in the Sultan nation of Toluene, then, if the Ortho has two positions? Well, let's take a look at the groups themselves. These are not to scale, but this is just to give you an idea. The sulfonate group is much bulkier than the methyl group. So that's really the main thing. Now, let's take a look at ortho substitution. And you can see here that the big bulky sulfonate group bumps against the methyl group. Think of it like two balloons tied on a string very close. They bump against each other, and this is not favorable. Favorable. So... Ortho substitution is not favored because the groups are large and they bump into each other. This is called steric bulk. So now let's take a look at para. And as you can see over here, para, they're on opposite sides. It readily happens because they, they aren't like touching each other. They're not very close. So this is perfectly fine. Now, remember when I said that methyl imparts a partial charge to the ortho and para positions? Yes, this does mean that we still have meta substitution. And in fact, I found this dissertation by someone where he sulfonated toluene in, um, in liquid sulfur dioxide, but it's still a sulfonation. It works the same way. He's just using a different like method. And you can see here that meta is actually more favored than ortho. And this makes perfect sense because the meta group is farther away from the actual methyl group. So yeah, this makes perfect sense. The ortho uh, sulfonation is really undesirable because it's really close, but meta is slightly off angle of that, and they aren't bumping against each other. But para is still most favored because it gives most room to each group. And as while it may not be pure paratoluene sulfonic acid we're getting, a decent amount of it is. And this is, like, this is perfectly fine. So if you want pure meta, um, pure paratoluene sulfonic acid, you have to make it by a different method. But, yeah. Anyways, that's how the sulfonation works itself, and I hope you enjoyed this video, especially the theoretical part of it. This is like my first time actually diving much into detail using my own research and not just something I found online. So yeah, tell me if you like this sort of video where I go into depth at the end, and uh, we'll be using this p paratoluene sulfonic acid in a future video. So yeah, look out for that. Subscribe. We're at 1K, and... Yeah, I know 1K, it's it's pretty neat, but uh, not exactly near monetization, but it's fine. Let's just get subscribers, why not? Subscribe if you want to see more interesting chemistry that isn't really talked about on YouTube, because I'll be doing some very interesting things soon. And um, yeah, that's sort of it for this video. See you guys in the next episode. Yeah.